merging of the three spiritual streams in the Bhagavad Gita. Today we stand at the point of founding the Anthroposophical Society in its narrower sense. Footnote, Dr. Steiner is referring here to the expulsion of the Anthroposophists from the Theosophical Society. A full account of these events can be found in Gunter Wachsmuth's book, The Life and Work of Rudolf Steiner, pages 186 to 189, available from the Anthroposophic Press, Incorporated. End of footnote. Just at this opportune moment, we would do well to remind ourselves of the importance and significance of our cause. What the Anthroposophical Society desires to be for modern culture should not, indeed, be different in principle from what we have always cultivated within our circles here as theosophy. But, perhaps, giving it a new name may call to mind again the earnestness and dignity with which we intend to work within our spiritual movement. From this viewpoint, <clears throat> the theme of this cycle of lectures has been chosen. At the beginning of our anthroposophical initiative, we will discuss a subject which, in, a most, in the most manifold way, is able to indicate the importance and meaning of our spiritual movement for the cultural life of the present time. Perhaps some may be surprised to find two such different spiritual streams as the great Eastern poem of the Bhagavad Gita and the letters written by one so closely connected with the founding of Christianity, the Apostle Paul, brought together. Footnote. The title Saint has been omitted in mentioning the Apostle Paul. This is in keeping with the German edition, and its use appears irrelevant in the context of these lectures. And footnote. <clears throat> we can best recognize the nearness of these two spiritual streams if we first indicate the place held in our time by the great Gita and everything connected with it, and then the interest of what laid the foundation of Christianity, the thought and work of Paul. Much in spiritual life today differs from what existed only a relatively short time ago, but just this difference makes necessary such a spiritual movement as anthroposophy. Only think how, not long ago, when a man entered into the spiritual life of his time, he had to consider three thousand year periods, one pre-Christian period and two others not quite completed, which have been saturated with the spiritual outstreaming of Christianity. <clears throat> what could such a man have said to himself who stood within the spiritual life of mankind up to a short time ago and could not justify a theosophical or anthroposophical movement as we mean it today? He could have said, At present something is entering spiritual life whose source can only be found in the thousand years preceding the Christian era. For not before this time do individual men as personalities have any meaning for spiritual life. However great and overpowering much in the spiritual streams of earlier times shone out to us, individualities did not stand out from what was the foundation for those streams. We need only look back to the spirituality of the old Egyptian or Chaldean Babylonian epochs to find a continuity in their spiritual life. Personalities as such, spiritually vigorous, came into prominence only in the following Greek period. Great teachings and a sweeping outlook into the far reaches of the cosmos are to be found in the Egyptian age, but only with the Greeks do outstanding figures begin to arise, like Socrates or Pericles, Phidias or Plato, Aristotle. Personality as such comes upon the scene. That is the outstanding characteristic of spiritual life in the last 3,000 years. <clears throat> I mean by this not only the important personalities, but the impress spiritual life makes upon every individual personality. If we may say so, in emphasis is put upon personality during these 3,000 years. Thereby the spiritual streams become significant in that personalities feel a need to take part in them, finding their inner comfort, hope, peace, inner bliss, and security through them. Because until a comparatively short time ago we were only interested in history, insofar as it proceeded from one personality to another, we had no deep understanding of what had occurred before the last three thousand years with Greek civilization, began that history that was the only history we had understood until a very short time ago, and at the turn of the first into the second millennium occurred all that was connected with the great being of Christ Jesus. In the first millennium the distinctive contribution of Greece predominated, whose source lay in the mysteries. 
We have often described what flowed out from them to the great poets, philosophers, and artists in every domain. For if we rightly understand Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides, we must seek the sources for understanding them in what flowed from the mysteries. Likewise, to understand Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, we must seek the source of their philosophy in the mysteries, not to speak of so towering a figure as Heraclitus. You can read about him in my book Christianity as Mystical Fact, how he relied entirely on the mysteries. Then we see how, with the second thousand years, the Christ impulse poured into spiritual development, gradually spreading through Greek culture and uniting itself with it. This second millennium so took its course that the powerful impulse of Christ united with what has come down to us as life and living tradition from the Greeks. We see how quite slowly Greek wisdom, feeling, and art were organically merged with this impulse of Christ. So passed the second thousand years. Then the third millennium of personality culture began. How differently does the Greek Greek influence show its effects during this epoch? We see it when we consider such artists as Raphael, Michelangelo, and Leonardo da Vinci. No longer does one observe Greek culture externally as something historically great, as was done in the second millennium. In the third, men had to turn directly to what came from Greece. We see how these three great artists let, let themselves be influenced by the great works of art coming to light again, how Greek culture was absorbed ever more consciously, in contrast to its unconscious influence felt in the second millennium. We see how this Greek influence was consciously embodied in a world conception, for instance, in the philosophy of Thomas Aquinas. How necessary it was for him to unite what flowed from Christian philosophy with that of Aristotle. Here, too, the Greek influence was assimilated so that together with the Christian influence it poured out in philosophical form and with Raphael, Michelangelo, and Leonardo in artistic form. <clears throat> this whole line of development continued on through spiritual life, even when a certain religious opposition appeared with Giordano Bruno and Galileo. In spite of all this, Greek ideas and concepts kept cropping up everywhere, particularly in relation to viewing nature. It was a conscious absorption of the Greek influence. But this did not go back further than Greek times. In all the people, not merely in the educated or the more highly cultured, but widespread among the simplest souls, such a spiritual life arose consciously out of the flowing together of Greek and Christian impulses. From university to peasant's hut, concepts taken from Greek and Christian ideas made their way. Then, in the nineteenth century, something quite unique entered, something actually formed and brought to light first by what is called theosophy or anthroposophy. There we see a single example of mighty forces in action. When, for the first time, the wonderful poem of the Bhagavad Gita became known in Europe, leading thinkers were enraptured by the greatness of this poem, by its profound content. It should never be forgotten that such a wise spirit as Wilhelm Humboldt could say after reading it <clears throat> that it was the most profound philosophical poem ever to come before his eyes. He made the beautiful comment that he was rewarded for living to be as old as he was by having been able to become acquainted with the Bhagavad Gita, the great spiritual song that sounded over from the primeval holiness of Eastern antiquity. <clears throat> How beautiful it is that slowly, even if not yet reaching a wide circle, Much of Eastern antiquity poured out into the 19th century from the Bhagavad Gita. For this poem is not like other writings that came over from the ancient East, writings that always convey to us Eastern thought and feeling from one or another point of view. In the Bhagavad Gita, however, we meet with the flowing together of all the various streams and points of view to be found in Eastern thinking, perception, and feeling. That is the significance of the Bhagavad Gita. Now let us look into ancient India. Overlooking unimportant features, we find, rising up out of dim prehistoric times, three subtly differing spiritual streams. One definite stream we encounter in the earliest Vedas. Then, in the later Vedic poems, we see its further development. It is a definite, but if we may put it so, a one-sided stream, which we will describe presently. Then we find a second stream in the Sankhya philosophy, and a third, different one, in yoga. 
those that meet us as the Sankhya system of Kapila, the yoga philosophy of Patanjali, and the Vedas have distinctly different colorings, which bring about their one-sidedness and through it actually their greatness. It is the harmonious interpenetration of all three streams that comes to expression in the Bhagavad Gita. What each of these three streams has to give us is to be found again in the Gita, not as a conglomerate, but as a harmonious blending into one organism, as if they had belonged together originally. It is the greatness of the Gita that it describes in such an all-inclusive way how the spiritual life of the East receives the contributions of these three streams. First I will briefly characterize what each of them can give us. The Veda stream is most pronounced as a philosophy of unity, the most spiritual monism imaginable, and it comes to completion in the Vedanta. If we are to understand the Veda philosophy, we must keep in mind that it is based on the idea that man finds the deepest within himself, actually as his own self. What he encompasses in ordinary life is a kind of expression or imprint of this self, that is, that man can develop and he gradually brings forth from the foundations of his soul the depths of his own self, as if slumbering in him is his higher self. It is not what present-day man knows directly, but what works in him as that toward which he is developing. When man will have achieved what lives in him as his self, he will become aware, according to the Veda philosophy, that this self is one with the all-encompassing world self. That is, that he not only rests with his self entirely in this cosmic self, but is one with it, relating to it in a twofold way. The Vedantist conceives the relationship between man's self and the world self as an in and out breathing, we could say. As outside is, as outside is air in general, and within us is the portion of it we have breathed in, so outside is the great self actively alive in and permeating everything. And when we give ourselves to observing it, we breathe it in. We breathe it in spiritually and with every feeling we have of it, with everything we receive into our soul. All knowledge, wisdom, thinking, feeling is spiritual breathing. <clears throat> what we take into our soul as part of the world self, but which remains bound up organically with it, is Atman, is breath, as indistinguishable from the general world self as the air we inhale is part of the air surrounding us. As we breathe out physically, so does the soul go out in devotion to this world self, giving the best that it has prayerfully and in sacrifice. That is the spiritual outbreathing, Brahman. Atman and Brahman, like in and outbreathing, make us participants in the all encompassing world self a monistically spiritual philosophy, which is at the same time a religion, meets us in the Vedas. Their blossom and fruit is that which brings such blessing to man, such assurance to the innermost and the highest reaches of his soul. The feeling of union with the universal, world-encompassing and permeating self, the undivided nature of the cosmos. The Vedic philosophy, we cannot say the Veda word, since Veda means word, deals with the unity of the world, with man's existence within the whole spiritual cosmos. <clears throat> the word Veda was itself breathed forth, according to the Vedic conception, by the all-encompassing unitary being, and can be taken into itself by the human soul as the highest formulation of knowledge. Accepting the Veda word means taking in the best part of the all-powerful self. It means becoming conscious of the connection between each human self and the all-encompassing world self. What the Veda says is the word of God, which is creative and is born again in human knowledge. Thus human knowledge is joined with the creative permeating principle underlying existence. Therefore what is written in the Vedas was considered as divine word, and he who was filled with it was the possessor of the divine word. In a spiritual way, this word came into the world and was set forth in the Veda books. <clears throat> Those who mastered these books took part in the world's creative principle. The situation is different in Sankhya philosophy. When this first meets us, as handed down by tradition, we see exactly the opposite to a teaching of unity. We can compare it to the philosophy of Leibniz. 
Sankhya philosophy is a pluralistic philosophy. The separate souls who confront us, human and divine, are not traced to a unified source in Sankhya philosophy, but are considered as existing singly from eternity, so to say, or at least as souls whose origin is not sought in unity. The plurality of souls is what meets us in Sankhya philosophy. The self-dependence of each single soul is sharply brought out. The soul pursuing its development in the world, enclosed within its own being. Against this pluralism stands what Sankhya philosophy calls the prakriti element. We cannot indicate it well by the modern word, word matter because this has a materialistic meaning. <coughs> As used in Sankhya philosophy, this is not the meaning intended in using the word substance, matter, which contrasts with the multiplicity of souls and yet does not lead back to unity. There is multiplicity of souls, and also what we can call the material basis equal to a primal flood streaming through the world spatially and in time, out of which souls take the elements of their outer existence. They must clothe themselves in this material element, which is not led back to a unity with the souls themselves. So it is that in Sankhya philosophy this material element is primarily and carefully studied. Not much attention is given to the separate souls. Each is considered a reality, entangled and bound up with the material basis, and in this materiality it assumes the most varied forms, showing itself outwardly in the most varied ways. A soul clothes itself with this basic material element, which, like this single soul, <coughs> has been thought of from eternity. The soul expresses itself in this material element, thereby taking on various forms. It is the study of these material forms that meets us, especially in the Sankhya philosophy. Above all, <coughs> above all, then, we have the most primeval form of this material element as a kind of primal spiritual flood in which the soul submerges. If we were to look at the beginning of evolution, we would find an undifferentiated material element and a multiplicity of souls dipping into it to carry on their evolution. The first to meet us as form, not yet so differentiated from the unity of the primal flood, is spiritual substance itself at the beginning of evolution. <clears throat> Next comes buddhi, with which souls individually can clothe themselves, so that if we think of the soul clothed by the primal flood substance, its appearance is not yet distinguishable from the general surging flood. Since the soul is not only enclosed in this first form of the general flood, but also in what can arise next, it can be unsheathed by buddhi. The third element that takes form, whereby the soul can become more and more individualized, is ahankara. That is the continually descending form of primal matter. So we have primal matter, whose next form is buddhi, and the next, ahankara. A fourth form is manas, following are the sense organs. Next, the finer elements. Finally, the material elements that we have in our physical environment. This, we may say, is the line of evolution as meant in Sankhya philosophy. Above is the most supersensible element of a spiritual primal flood, gradually condensing to the coarse elements from which the coarse human body is built. In between are the substances out of which our sense organs are woven, and the finer elements that give rise to our etheric or life body. Note well that all this constitutes sheaths for the soul, as meant by Sankhya philosophy. Even that which arose from the first primal flood is a sheath of the soul wherein it is contained. Thus, when the Sankhya philosopher studies buddhi, ahankara, manas, and the senses, the finer and coarser elements, he means the evidencifying sheaths in which the soul comes to expression. We must be clear that the way the Veda and Sankhya philosophies confront us is only possible because they were formulated in those ancient times when a primal clairvoyance existed, at least to a certain degree. These philosophies came into being in different ways. The Vedas depended on a primal yet for earliest humanity a naturally existing inspiration that man had no part in creating except that he prepared himself in his whole being to receive quietly and passively this divine inspiration that came by itself. 
It was otherwise in the development of the Sankhya philosophy. There one could say it was similar to our present method of learning, only that we are not permeated by clairvoyance while they were. It was clairvoyant science, inspiration bestowed by grace from above, that produced the Veda philosophy. Science as we cultivate it today, but carried on by people endowed with clairvoyance, that was this was Sankhya philosophy. <clears throat> Therefore this latter left the purely soul element undisturbed. It said, In what one can study in the outer supersensible form, souls express themselves, but we study these outer forms in which souls clothe themselves. So we find a developed system of forms as they meet us in the world. As we in our science find the total of nature's facts, only that in the Sankhya philosophy one advances to a supersensible observation of phenomena. This philosophy is a science which, though attained through clairvoyance, remains a science of outer forms, not pressing on into the realm of the soul, which remains untouched by the studying. One who devotes himself to the Vedas feels his religious life entirely united with the life of wisdom. Sankhya philosophy is science, is knowledge of forms in which the soul expresses itself. At the same time its adherents can feel alongside their science a religious devotion. How the soul element then inserts itself into the forms, not the soul itself but the way it is inserted, this can be followed up in the Sankhya philosophy. <clears throat> How the soul increasingly guards its independence or descends further into matter can be discerned in Sankhya philosophy. One has to do with soul nature, which indeed descends, but in the material forms protects its own being. A soul nature that has submerged in outer form but has proclaimed and revealed itself as soul nature lives in the sattva element, S-A-T-T-W-A. A soul immersed in form, but which, it, but which is, so to say, overwhelmed by the form and cannot rise above it, lives in the tamas element, T-A-M-A-S. When the soul can, to a certain extent, keep a balance between its own element and its expression in form, it lives in the rajas element, R-A-J-A-S. Sattva, rajas, tamas, the three gunas, G-U-N-A-S, are the essential characteristics of what we call Sankhya philosophy. <clears throat> Again it is otherwise with that spiritual stream that comes down to us as yoga. This deals immediately with the soul's nature and seeks ways of taking hold of the soul directly so that it rises from its present situation to ever higher stages. Thus Sankhya observes the soul's sheaths and yoga leads it to ever higher stages of inner experience. Devotion to yoga, therefore, signifies a gradual awakening of the higher forces of the soul, so that it may experience what is beyond everyday life and can discover ever higher stages of existence. Yoga, then, is the way to the spiritual worlds, the way, of, the way to freeing the soul from its outer forms, the way to its independent inner life. Yoga is the other side of the Sankhya philosophy. <clears throat> it acquired its great importance when that inspiration from on high given by grace in the Vedas could no longer descend. Yoga had to be resorted to by those souls who, belonging to a later human epoch, no longer received any direct revelations, but had to work their way up from lower stages to the heights of spiritual existence. Thus in the primeval Indian time there arose three sharply differentiated spiritual streams, the Veda, the Sankhya, the Yoga. Today we are called upon to bring them together again by lifting them out of the foundations of the soul and the depths of the cosmos in the way suited to our present age. You can find all three streams again in our spiritual science. Only read what I sought to present in my occult science in the first chapters on the human constitution sleeping and waking, life and death. Then you have what is in today's meaning can be called Sankhya philosophy. Then read what is said there about the world's evolution from Saturn to our time and you have the Veda philosophy in modern terms. In the last chapters dealing with man's development you have yoga expressed for the present time. Our age must unite in an organic way what radiates over to us out of ancient India in these three philosophical streams.
For that reason we must also be concerned with the wonderful Bhagavad Gita, which in a deeply poetic way contains as if in a summary the three streams reaching so deeply into our age. We must seek something like congeniality between our spiritual striving and the deeper content of the Bhagavad Gita. Not only in the whole of our present-day spiritual streams are there points of contact with the older spiritual streams, but in details as well. <clears throat> you will have recognized that in my occult science an effort was made to present things entirely out of their own inherent nature, never borrowing anything from history. Anyone who really understands what is said there concerning Saturn, Sun, and Moon cannot find any assertion taken from historical sources. Out of the subject itself are the statements made. But how remarkable it is that what bears the imprint of our age harmonizes in critical places with what sounds over to us from ancient times. Here is one small example. At a certain place in the Vedas we read somewhat as follows about cosmic evolution. Quote, in the beginning <clears throat> darkness was enveloped in darkness. Everything was an undifferentiated flood. There arose a great void which was everywhere permeated by warmth. Unquote. Now I ask you to recall what was taken from the event itself concerning the constitution of Saturn, where its substance was spoken of as comprised of warmth. <clears throat> Feel how what is newest in spiritual science coincides with what is said in the Vedas. The next passage runs, quote, Then the will first arose, which was the first seed of thinking, connecting existence with non-existence, and this connection is found in the will. Unquote. Remember how in new terms the spirits of will were mentioned. In all that we ha have had to say in the present time, we have not sought to be in accordance with the old. Rather, the harmony has come of itself, because truth was sought there, and truth was sought again here, on our own ground. Now, in the Bhagavad Gita, we are met at once with a poetic glorification of the three spiritual streams we have described, in an important moment of world history, important for that ancient time, the great teaching that Krishna himself gave to Arjuna is presented to us. The moment is important because it was when the old blood ties were loosening. In everything that will be said in these lectures on the Bhagavad Gita, remember what has often been referred to, namely how the ancient blood ties, racial connections, tribal kinships, had special significance, and only gradually did they cease. Recall everything said in my lecture, The Occult Significance of Blood. Loosening these blood ties caused mighty warfare to break out, described for us in the Mahabharata, of which the Gita is an episode. There we see how the descendants of two brothers, still tied by blood, separate as to their spiritual direction, how that which through the blood had previously given them a unified point of view takes different paths, so there is conflict, because conflict must arise through this separation, wherein the blood ties also lose their importance for clairvoyant knowledge. With this separation, then, the later course of spiritual development sets in. To those for whom the old blood ties have no significance, Krishna appears as the great teacher. He is to be the teacher for the new age set free of the old blood ties. Tomorrow we shall describe how he does this. Here we may say what the whole Gita poem shows, that Krishna deals with the three spiritual streams we have mentioned as an organic unity and imparts this to his pupil. <clears throat> how then must this pupil appear before us? In one direction he looks up to his father, in the other to his father's brother. The cousins are no longer to stay close, they must separate, but now each line is taken hold of by a different stream. Arjuna is dominated by the question, quote, How will it be when that which the blood ties would hold together is no longer there? How is one's soul to find its place in spiritual life if this life can no longer flow along as before, under the influence of the old blood ties? Everything must come to ruin, unquote, or so it seems to Arjuna. That things must be different, but without such an outcome, is the content of the great teaching of Krishna. Krishna now shows his pupil, who is to live through the transition from the one epoch to the other, how the soul, to maintain its harmony, must take in something from all three spiritual streams. The Vedic teaching of unity is rightly presented in the teaching of Krishna, likewise the essence of the Sankhya teaching, 
and of yoga. For what lies behind all that we are to learn from the Gita? Krishna speaks somewhat like this, quote, There is a universal creative word that contains the creative principle itself. As the air undulates and comes alive with the sound of man's voice when he speaks, the cosmic word surges and lives in all things, creating and ordering existence. So does the Veda principle breathe through all things. It can be taken up by man's understanding into his soul life. There is a ruling, surging creator word, and an echo of this is in the Vedas. This word is the creative force in the world and is revealed in the Vedas. End quote. <clears throat> that is one part of the Krishna teaching. Man's soul is able to understand how the word comes to expression in the world's forms. Man learns to know the laws of existence in seeing how the separate forms show an orderly expression of the soul's spiritual. The teaching about these world forms, about the laws underlying them, and their ways of working, this is Sankhya philosophy, the other part of Krishna's teaching. Even as he makes clear to his pupil that behind all existence is the world creative word, he emphasizes that human understanding can recognize the separate forms, that is, can take world laws into his own being, world word, world law, echoing in the Vedas, in Sankhya, this Krishna reveals to his pupil. He also speaks to him of the way <clears throat> that leads the individual pupil to the heights, where he can share in knowledge of the world word. Krishna speaks also of yoga. Threefold is his teaching of the word, of the law, and of reverent devotion to the spirit. Word, law, and devotion. These are the three streams by which the soul can carry on its development. They will always be working on the soul in one way or another. We certainly have seen how the new spiritual science in its new manner of expression must seek these three streams. But the epochs of time differ, and the threefold form of the world picture is brought to man's soul in the most varied ways. Krishna speaks of the world word, the creator word, of the structure of existence, of the devotional deepening of the soul, of yoga. The same trinity meets us again, only in a more concrete living way, in a being thought of as walking the earth, embodying the divine creative word. The Vedas approaching, excuse me, the Vedas approached humanity in abstract form. The divine logos of which the Gospel of John speaks is the living creative word itself. What we encounter in the Sankhya philosophy is the lawful ordering of cosmic forms, transposed historically into the old Hebraic revelation, becomes what Paul refers to as the law. Faith in the risen Christ proclaimed by Paul appears as the third member of the Trinity. What yoga is with Krishna is carried over by Paul, in reality into faith, which should take the place of the law. Thus Veda, Sankhya, Yoga are the dawn of what later rose as the sun, S-U-N. Veda arises again in the being of Christ himself, appearing actually in historical development, not pouring abstractly into the expanses of space and time, but as a single individuality, as the living word. In Sankhya philosophy we met the law, in what was shown there as the material basis, prakriti, evolved down to coarse substance. The law reveals how the world came into being and how individual man is formed within this world. <clears throat> this is expressed in the old Hebraic doctrine of the law, in all that Moses represents. Insofar as Paul points to this law of the ancient Hebrews, he points to Sankhya philosophy. Insofar as he points to faith in the risen Christ, he indicates the sun preceded by the dawn in yoga. So in this remarkable way arises that which met us in its first elements as Veda, Sankhya, Yoga. <clears throat> what came before us as the Veda appears in a new but now actual form as the living word, out of which all things were made, and without which nothing is made that was made, and which in the course of time became flesh. Sankhya appears as the historic law-founded representation of the way the world of phenomena, the world of coarse substances, came into being out of the world of the Elohim. Yoga is transformed into what was expressed by Paul in the words, quote, Not I, but the Christ in me, unquote, which means that when the power of Christ permeates and absorbs the soul, man rises to the heights of the divine. Thus we see the existence of a unified plan throughout world history, 
how Orientalism prepared it, how what first emerged in abstract form appeared in such a remarkable way in more concrete forms in the Christianity of Paul. We shall see that precisely through grasping the connection between the great Bhagavad Gita and the epistles of Paul, the deepest mysteries are revealed concerning what may be called the activity of the spirit in the collective education of the human race. Because one must feel such a new element in this new era, this modern age must go back beyond the time of Greece and develop understanding for what lay behind the first pre-Christian millennium, for what appeared as Veda, Sankhya, and Yoga. So as Raphael in art and Thomas Aquinas in philosophy had to turn back to Greek culture, we will see how in our time a conscious adjustment must be made between what the present time means to achieve and what existed before the Greek age, reaching into the depths of Eastern antiquity. We can allow these depths of ancient culture to come nearer to our soul when we observe those different spiritual streams in their wonderfully harmonious unity as they meet us in that greatest philosophical poem, as Humboldt said, the Bhagavad Gita.